Pharaoh lost all those battles to the Lord. He had to give in to Israel. What did Israel have? They have a covenant with the Almighty God. That's what they got. They are protected by God. When you mess with Israel, and now every time I say Israel, I'm talking about us also, born again believers. And later on, I'm going to give the scripture for that. But whenever I say Israel, I'm talking about us also. But when you mess with Israel, you're messing with the wife of God. If Israel is the wife of God, what's that make us? The wife. We're the wife of God also. Remember, with Israel and Christians, same thing. This is another teaching, but Israel is the we are the wife of God. In Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, speaking about Jesus, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. This is us. We're saints. God says we're saints. We're dressed in fine linen, clean and white. And that makes us, also in Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So the Lord's putting himself in the same boat as the husband. And just like I'm telling you to love your wife, just like I love my church, the bride. So we are we are the bride of Christ. Pharaoh lost a lot going against Israel. He lost his crops. He lost his army. He lost his power. And like I said, the hardest of them all, he lost his son. This is what happens. This is what happens. Many people don't know this. When you're messing with a Christian, you're messing with God. I'm showing you right here and I'm going to show you some more. But when you mess with Christians, you're messing with the Lord. And I'm going to show you that in the New Testament. Acts chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. This is when Paul was killing Christians. Well, he was Saul. When he was killing Christians, his name was Saul. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, it says, And he fell to the earth... This is Saul. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why prosecutest thou me? Now what did, what did the Lord say? He said, why are you prosecuting me? He didn't say, why are you prosecuting my children? He didn't say, why are you prosecuting the Christians? He said, why are you prosecuting me? So as he was prosecuting Christians, he was doing the same thing to the Lord. See that here? Verse 5. And he said, Saul said, who art thou? Lord? It's a question. He's saying, is this the Lord? Is that you, Lord? That's what Saul is saying. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou prosecutest. So this shows you plainly right here. You mess with Christians, you're messing with the Lord. What you do to us, what people do to us, they're doing it to the Lord. Because right here it shows it. Jesus said, why are you prosecuting me? After this happened, what happened to Saul? He gave his heart to the Lord and went into covenant with him and what happened God changed his name just like I showed you in, 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 the, in the red covenant the, the steps part of it is God changes your name our name is Christian Jesse Christian so now if Saul wouldn't have gave his life to the Lord what do you think would have happened to Saul if he would have kept on prosecuting the Christians the Lord would have the Lord would have taken care of him how? I don't know. But believe me. He, he was pointing to Saul and saying, Why are you doing this to me? And you think he was just going to let it go? Yeah. Mm -mm. But Saul, Saul saw what he was doing. And that's why I accepted the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 20. They had a great army that came against the king of Israel. Jeho Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat and the people were afraid. Now this is the Jews. This is Israel. They had a great army in, uh, uh, against them, and they got afraid. Joseph had, and the, all the people gathered together and prayed to the Lord. And this is what they prayed. Now listen to this prayer. This is just one of the prayers. But listen to these prayers that the people made to the Lord. You know, praying is just you speak your heart to the Lord. And this is exactly what these people did. Second Chronicles, chapter 20. I'm going to read verse 6 through 12 and then 15 through 20. He prayed, O Lord, 
God of our ancestors reminding God of the covenant he, that's what he's doing here God of our ancestors remember you're in covenant with, the, with my grandparents you alone are the God who is in heaven you are ruler of all the kingdom of the earth you are powerful and mighty no one can stand against you see how he's just praising God every time we pray we should just praise the Lord praise him before you even say anything for yourself just praise God you're going to see this in these that's why I'm reading these prayers to you that these people made because they knew how to pray verse 7 O our God again showing that their father is God did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived and did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name they said whatever we are faced with any calamity such a war plague or famine we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored we can cry out to you to save us and you will hear us and rescue us Amen. Amen. These people knew how to pray. They knew. They were in covenant with the Lord. And they could say, hey Lord, we're yours. You're supposed to protect us. Now we're not telling him he, he has to. We're not telling him what to do. But we kind of just, not that he needs reminding. But we kind of just say things like that. Lord, you said you would protect us. Amen. Zechariah 13, 9 says, They shall call on my name. And I will hear them, and I, I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. So they shall call on my name. That's what the Lord says. They will call on me when they need help. And that's what we're supposed to do. If we're in trouble, if, if we need help, we call on the name of the Lord. Very first thing, before we even think about, well, how I'm going to fix this, or what I'm going to do here. Before we even think that way. We call on the Lord. Lord, this problem right here, I'm, ca I'm calling you. Verse 10. And now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mitzir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of our land. Out of your land. This is God's land. That's why I said, they, they, they've come to throw us out of your land. How many of us know that none of this is ours? Whatever we have is not ours. If you got a good job, God gave it to you. If you have nice things, material, God gave it to you. If you walk with the Lord, God gave you all this. And this is what they're saying. They're coming to throw us out of your land. Which you gave us as an inheritance, as a promise. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us we do not know what to do but we're looking to you for help how many of us do that seriously how many of us do that when we come across trouble when we feel like we're being attacked how many of us stop right then and there fall on our knees and say Lord help me I'm being attacked how many of us do that we need to do that if you're not doing it you need to start doing it God is your father God is your any army that comes against you, God can take care of it. Amen. And we know that. But do we go to Him for this help? A lot of times we go in the flesh and we think of how we're going to do it. And then when our way doesn't work, then we go to the Lord. Yeah. That's just the opposite. We should go to the Lord first. We are powerless without the Lord. When we don't know, when we don't know what to do, we go for His guidance. So he can show us what to do. And he'll always show us. He'll, everywhere in the Bible that I've read, God has always been there to show them the way. I'm going to drop to verse 15. <clears throat> he said, listen all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Now listen to what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. How many of us heard that? How many of us really heard that? I'm not just reading here. These are the words of the Lord. God said, God said, Do not be afraid. 
Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Is that an amen or what? Amen. I mean, how many of us really believe that? Really trust that? Hey, I, I, this, this big problem that's coming my way, I don't know anything about it, but I know who can handle it. Amen. It's, it's my father's fight. My father said, all I need to do is stand. Stand on his words. Amen? Amen. That's all we need to do. How many of us do that? Like I said, don't, I don't want no, don't want you raising your hand, but how many Christians do that? We get in the habit of doing it ourselves, take care of it our, ourselves. Okay, verse 16. <laughs> Tomorrow, march out against them. They were behind a great wall. At this time, they were behind a great wall. And they felt safe behind that wall. And God's time to go out. Now here's this great army. Get the picture. There's this great army out there. They're behind this big concrete wall. And God's telling them to go out. So why is he telling them that? Because we depend on other things besides the Lord for our protection. They thought this wall was their protection. God's showing them, this wall is not protecting you. I'm going to protect you. I want you to go out beyond this wall. Y'all hear that? Do y'all hear that? What we feel like, oh, this... Whatever is protecting me. If it's not God, it's wrong. God's telling them to go out beyond the wall. What, what it is, He was telling them, leave your worldly protection. Whatever it is that is not of the Lord, it's a worldly thing. Do y'all hear me? It's worldly. You need to depend on God. And then it says, you will find them coming up through the ascent of Zin at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jewel. But you will not even need to fight. How many, how many times does the Lord have to tell you this for you to understand? For it to get into your brain. How many times does He have to tell you? Because he's ta He tells us many times in the Bible. You do not have to fight. If someone's bullying me, they're messing with God. Should I be scared? Should I be afraid? Take your positions, meaning stand on His words, then stand still, and watch the Lord's victory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Do you know that this is a command from the Lord? He's telling us. He's saying, do not be afraid or discouraged. That's a command. Do we obey it? Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. This is the answer to all, your, to all of our problems. Let the Lord go with us. Let the Lord lead us. Let the Lord be in front of us. A lot of times we leave the Lord behind us. A lot of times. And you might not know you're doing it, but when you don't use the Lord as your power, as your strength, He's behind you. Because you, then you're using your own or whatever you think that is worldly is strong enough to take care of whatever problem you got. Don't have the Lord behind you. Have Him in front of you. Verse 18. Then King Jehoshaphat, now this is what, when after the Lord spoke to him, this is what happens. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. You pray to him, and then you bow down to him and worship him. What is worshiping? Bound down. Worshiping is bound down. Worshiping Everywhere in the Bible, and I have a teaching on it, true worshiping. Everywhere in the Bible where they, where they said they worshiped, they fell to the ground. That's worshiping. Verse 19. Then the Levites from the clans of Goath and Gorod stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. So go out, live a Christian life with boldness. We have too many Christians that are out there like wimps. They're like wimps. They're scared to be bold on who they are. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm not that way. Thank you for putting on me that I am not that way. It's because of Him. It's because of Him. If I have boldness, it's because of the Holy Spirit that lives in me. Let everybody know. Let everybody know who your God is. Who in... Don't raise your hands which I don't think anybody will raise it, but who in here is ashamed of the Lord? We shouldn't be. He's everything to us. 
He provides us everything we need and some of our wants. So why should we be ashamed of Him? When there's nobody who can beat Him, nobody who can stand up to Him, and He tells us, stay behind me. I'm going to take care of everything. I'm going to fight for you. Now why should we be ashamed of a God that does that for us? Verse 20, early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tokia. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. Amen? Amen. This is, I mean, he says to do this, and if we do it, we will succeed. Y'all need to go back and read the whole chapter. Read this chapter. Y'all need to go home and read this chapter and let the Lord really, really, really speak to you. This is a good chapter. It's a good chapter to tell us, to show us who we are. We're in covenant with God Almighty. We're in covenant with Him. And this is how we need to be. We need not to be afraid. We need to have, we, we have strength and we have encouragement by Him. This is the way we ought to live when we're in covenant with the Almighty God. Many Christians do not live this way. And it makes me mad. It really does. It makes me mad. But someone that I know that is really born again Christian, I know they are. And I see them living a defeated life. Wake up, man. You are a child of God. Why are you living this way? Wake up. I'm hoping this teaching will wake us up. And by me going, you know, getting it together... I mean, I already know this, but it just reinforces me to be even more bolder. It enforces me to be, to be more at peace with my life, knowing that God has everything under control. Amen. Hunter, are you letting God have everything in control in your life? Yes, sir. Are you? Are you depending on Him to show you what you need to learn? That's what we need. We need to do that with, in every part of our life. Every part of our life. Amen. Some of us think, well, we only go to the Lord when, when we have trouble. Or we have problems. No, the Lord, He wants everything. He wants your happiness. He wants everything. Amen. Now back to Moses and Aaron. People in other nations who didn't believe in God thought that Moses was doing something very irresponsible by taking the Jews out of Egypt, which was like over two million people. Over two million people were taken into the wilderness. By Moses. By Moses. Now, do you think Moses had faith in God? Do you think him as a man by himself would take two million people out in the wilderness? I didn't know that many people. Yeah. Oh, it was a great number. Moses had his faith. He had his everything on the Lord. Really? There's no way Moses in the flesh or thinking he was a mighty man, thinking he was a mighty man, was going to take that many people out into the wilderness. Right. Was he going to provide them water? Right. Was he going to provide them food, shelter, clothes? Only God could do that. Amen. He took all those people out into the wilderness, and God provided all this for him, for them, their food, their shelter, their clothes. He just took he took care of them. You know this. Some of that wilderness was there is desert. They had no water. And if that's another teaching, but the Jews would complain and start yelling at Moses, we don't have no water. We, you, you brought us out here to die. Die of thirst. God had to show them, look, I'm here. Somehow, some way, the Lord brought them water. They didn't know who Moses' God was. Like I said, they thought he was taking on the, taking on the responsibility that no man can do. They didn't know who Moses' God was. That's all I can say. The people that were fleeing Egypt, they saw this army. Pharaoh's army. They're trapped. There's a sea right here. The Red Sea. Here's an army coming out. All we are is farmers. Servants. That's all we are. And here's an army coming after us. Screaming and hollering at Moses again. Don't say anything. Because believe it or not, there's a lot of Christians who do the same thing. They panicked. But what did the Lord do? He, he told Moses, lift up your, hand, your arms. And he opened the sea. He opened the Red Sea so they could go through it. And it says they did it 
on dry land. Exodus 14, 16, it says they crossed the sea on dry land. Now we're talking a sea where water's been there for I don't know how long. Yeah. You think that's going to be dry? No, that's going to be muddy. But look what God does. Does He do it the right way? Aye. Okay, I'm going to open the sea, but there's a lot of mud you're going to have to cross through. <laughs> no. -uh. Uh, when God does it, He does it right. Amen. It says they crossed on dry land. That's a miracle. Amen. Just open sea is, is a miracle. But not only did He do that, but he cro they crossed on dry land. That's our God. That's your God. He takes care of us completely. Amen. Well, you might get your feet wet a little. No. They didn't get their feet wet. They didn't get their feet muddy. They crossed on dry land. But like I said, the people, the people would panic. Every time they came across a problem, they would panic. We need, not, we need to learn from the Jews. Because if we don't, we're going to be just like them. When hard times come, we're going to panic. I'm sure God saw Israel. And he saw exactly what it says in Matthew 8, 26. It says, And he saith unto them, Why are, you, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Do you want to be of little faith? Do you want to live your life with just a little faith? I don't. I have faith in my God. If I read it in the words, in the scriptures, if I read it, I believe it. No ifs, ands, or buts. Well, I, no, I believe it. I don't care what it says. When I gave my life to the Lord, I said from the very beginning, I'm going to believe everything the Bible says. I made that a commitment when I first gave my life to the Lord. I will believe everything in this Bible. And I do. God did what? What did God tell the people? God said, I'm going to take you to the promised land. Are we supposed to believe that? Shouldn't have they believe God when he said, I'm taking you to the promised land? A lot of times we like, he tells us something, but then we don't believe it. I mean, they had Christians doing it all the time. Just like uh, the disciples on the boat. He told them before they left, he said, we're going to the other side. They had to cross the sea. And, God, and Jesus said, we're going to the other side. If Jesus said, we're going to the other side, where are you going? You're going to the other side. But the, but the seas got rough. They got scared. They had to call on Jesus. Oh, ye of little faith. Didn't you hear me? I said, we're going to the other side. Why didn't you believe that? We got to do the same thing with the words. There's, when you're reading the Bible and you're like, Oh, I don't know about that. No. You do know about it. God can and will. There is nothing too impossible for Him. Nothing. We need to believe that. When He says it, believe it. He provided the cloud during the day because of the sun. Because of the sun, he provided, the Bible says, he provided the cloud to stay over the people. He controls the weather, right? Mm -hmm. The clouds listen to him. The seas listen to him. That's God. And he said, cloud, stay over my people. Keep them with shade. And the clouds did it. Amen? Amen. Now, if the clouds can listen to him, if the seas can listen to him, why can't we listen to him? Like I said, he provided everything they needed. This is covenant. We're in covenant with God. And just like in, when I was teaching it, and I'm still teaching it, but before, at the very beginning, the Daiki covenant, that's where God does everything. We do nothing but believe and receive. Amen? Amen. Amen. What, else, I mean, what else kind of covenant would you want? Really? Hey, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to take care of everything. All I want you to do is believe me. Receive me. Obey me. It's like... God, you can do something. <laughs> now, this is where we're going to go to, in your Bible, turn to De Deuteronomy, chapter 8. I love this chapter, that's why I decided I'm going to read this chapter to y'all. Now, I'm going to be reading it out of the Living Bible, because it makes it much more easier to understand. But I want you to get the full impact of it. This is the Word of God. Chapter 8. You must obey all the commandments I give you today. If you do, you will not only live, you will multiply and will go in and take over the land promised to your fathers by the Lord. By obeying, by, by obeying them, they will receive the promise. That's what it's saying. 
Do you remember how the Lord led your led you through the wilderness for all those 40 years, humbling you and testing you to find out how you would respond and whether or not you would really obey Him? You think the Lord tests us? Hmm. He tests us. He already knows, but He's showing you. <laughs> he's showing us where we're at. Yes, He humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously, previously unknown to both you and your ancestors. He did it to help you realize that food isn't everything and that real life comes by obeying every command of God. You want real life? You want real life? Obey God. Obey the commands of God. That's real life. For all these 40 years, your clothes haven't grown old. Your feet haven't been blistered or swollen. So you should realize that. As a man punishes his son, the Lord punishes you to help you. Just like a father chastises his son, spanks him or whatever, God does, God does the same thing to us. When we're not listening, when we don't obey, sometimes he has to take us to the woodshed. You don't want to go to the woodshed. I've been to the woodshed, okay? I've been there. I know what the woodshed is. Verse 6. Obey the laws of the Lord your God. Walk in his ways and fear him. Fear him doesn't mean scared. Respect him. That's what fear means right here. It means respect him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of, of brooks, pools, gushing springs, valleys, and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, olives, and honey. It is a land where food, where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, bless the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. So right here is just saying, whatever the Lord has given you, we need to thank Him. Everything you have, whether it's big or small, we need to thank Him. Because it comes from Him. It comes from Him. If you're walking with Him. Okay? If you're walking with Him. It says to bless Him. Verse 11, but that is the time to be careful. Now He's going to tell us, now be careful. Beware that you're plenty, you don't forget the Lord, your God, and begin to disobey Him. Let me just stop there just for a second. This happens. I've seen it myself. I've seen it. My Bible study, which was before y'all even got here, I had Bible study. And there was a couple. The guy didn't have a job, needed a job. We prayed. We prayed. He got a good job. Good job. Made good money. What happened to Bible study? Gone. What happened with him living and walking with the Lord? Gone. This is what happened right here. He thought it was him that got him all that stuff. All that good job. He thought it was him. Right here we're going to see. Beware. That in your plenty you don't forget the Lord your God and begin to disobey him. For when you have become full and prosperous... And have built fine homes to live in. And when your flocks and herds have become very large. And your silver and gold have multiplied. That is the time to watch out that you don't become pride. And forget the Lord your God who brought you out of your slavery in the land of Egypt. The one who took you out of that sin that you was living in. Before you got saved again. The one who took you out of the gutter. Don't forget him when he gives you all this stuff. That's what he's saying right here. Don't forget him. He took you out of the gutter. He took me out of the, He took us all of us out of the gutter. So we don't forget all that he's done for us. Amen. Verse 15. Beware that you don't forget the God who led you through the great and terrible wilderness with the dangerous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock he fed you with manna in the wilderness. It was a kind of bread unknown before, so that you would become humble and so that your trust in Him would grow and He could do you good. He did it so that you would never feel that it was your own power and might 
that made you wealthy. So I'm saying, this this friend of mine, apparently he must have thought that was him. Well, well, now I got all this. Why do I need the Lord? And people do that. I got all this. Why do I need the Lord? Don't get caught up in that. The Lord's telling us right here. Don't get caught up in that. Remember where you came from. And remember everything that you have comes from Him. Because He can take everything you have at any time He wants. At any, remember that. At any time He wants, He can take totally everything away from you. Verse 18. Always remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you power to become rich. And He does it to fulfill His promise to your ancestors. But if you forget about the Lord your God and worship other gods instead and follow evil ways, you shall certainly perish just as the Lord has caused other nations in the past to perish. That will be your fate too if you don't obey the Lord your God. This chapter, I had to read the whole chapter. The whole chapter is good. It warns us of what not to do. But also, it also tells us how good our God is to us. Right. Amen. Amen. Again, two chapters I want you to read when you get home, because they're very. They're, I mean, they should touch your heart. Yeah. They should. I love. I mean, when I read the chapter, I thought I'm gonna have to read this out loud, the whole chapter. Many times, the problems with Christians is they don't go to the Lord with their problems. I am always saying that because it's true. Do we believe them? I mean, do we really believe him? When he says, the fight is mine, not yours. Whatever the problem is, I'll take care of it. You just stand on my word. Can we, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? Don't say anything because there's only one way you can show if you believe it or not. And that's when the time comes, do you follow it? Or we can say, just like Peter, Peter said, oh, I never deny you, Christ. But what happened? And he meant it. I'm sure he meant it. He really believed that he wouldn't. But when the time came, what happened? He was weak. He didn't use the power of God. So we watch it. Watch it that we don't do that. So that's what I'm saying. When the time comes, then you'll know if you would do it or not. When the time comes. Until we start to understand what blood covenant means, what it really means, we're not going to be poor in spirit. Because blood covenant means we have nothing. God has everything. That's when you become poor in spirit. And I did a teaching on poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is when you're totally humble to the Lord. Totally humble to Him. Because you know you need Him for everything. That's when you're poor in spirit. There's a lot of people who are not poor in spirit. Because they don't recognize, where, the, like I said, where the Lord brought us out of. If I was garbage, no, not if. I was garbage. And I know that. And now He's made me who I am today. A child of His. I'm a child of God. Amen. Only because He took me out of that garbage. It wasn't because I deserved it. It wasn't because I did something great and mighty that on my own power. The Lord reached down and I reached up. I grabbed His hand. And He pulled me out of that garbage. He did. Amen? Amen. We, you know... I keep going. We're, we're just going to have a revival tonight, okay? Because really, I mean, this is... I wish more Christians would be poor in spirit. Knowing, okay, I was here, but now I'm here. Why? Because of God. Because of the Lord. But you have people who take credit. On, they take the credit for it. That's not a good thing to do. We're going to learn, we're going to learn from Joshua now. Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Now this is the Lord speaking to Joshua. Verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you as long as, as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. Now this is God speaking to Joshua now. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to your ancestors. I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning neither to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instructions continually. Meditate on it day and night. That's Psalms 1 2. It says that. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. 
Only then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. Who wants to prosper? Who wants to succeed? This is the formula right here. This is it. Obey God. Obey everything written in it. Meaning in the word of God. You want to be prosperous and succeed? Obey God. Now this prosperous and succeeding might be a different way, might be a different way than what you're thinking. You might be, you know, some people might be thinking, oh, I can be rich. No. The Lord doesn't talk about material things. Prosper and succeed. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge. That's prospering. That's, that's succeeding in life is knowing and understanding the words of God. That's what we're talking about. So people read this and say, oh, I'm going to do this so I can be rich. No, that's not what the Lord's talking about. Verse 9, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Are we ever alone? Mm -hmm. If you're in a, a dark place somewhere, are you by yourself? No. Do you need to be afraid? I mean, you get in a dark room or a dark house, they don't have demons. Demons can't touch you. If you're a child of God, demons cannot touch you. So don't be scared, oh, there's some demon in here going to get me. No, no, no. If you're a child of God, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, you do not have to be afraid. The, Holy, the demons cannot touch you. They cannot. The biggest part of these promises to the Lord that the Lord gave us was to accept Him, to believe in Him. And His promise to us is He would give us everything we needed. Everything we need. And like I said, in some of our wants, all we need to do is accept and receive Him. That's pretty simple. That's pretty easy. Hey, just listen to me. Just obey me. And I will give you everything you need. Now remember, I'm saying the word need. God knows what we need and He will supply us our needs. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you're walking with Him, you will not go hungry. You will not go thirsty. You will have clothes. You will have shelter. He will give you everything you need when you're walking with Him. Amen. That's the Lord. All He wants is for us to believe Him. To accept Him. To receive Him. He's the seed. Back in Genesis... The seed was promised to us. Well, that seed was Jesus. So now we have him. And, be, and Jesus went to heaven. He said, hey, in, unless I go to heaven, I can't send you the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. And who is the Holy Spirit? Jesus. So he's saying, hey, unless I go to heaven, I can't send the Holy Spirit down to you to give you strength, to, to, to give you power. So he had to go up. So he could come back and live in us. This God I've been telling you about, that I've been these scriptures I'm reading, this God lives in us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes I wonder how I can control myself. <laughs> I mean, seriously, can you really comprehend it? This God, this Almighty God, lives in me. You do believe in the Trinity, right? God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three are one. So if you have the Holy Spirit where God said, where Jesus said, hey, I'm going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to live in you, well then that means all three of them are living in us. Amen. Believe it. Believe it. Once you believe it, once we can comprehend that, take it in, I'm telling you, it's going to make a change in your life. Amen. It will. But the one thing we need to do, we need to believe. And if we believe, that means we're going to obey Him. We're going to obey Him. You can't believe in Him and disobey Him. Because if you're disobeying Him, you're not believing what He's saying. Because you're disobeying Him. You don't think it's good for you or whatever. So you have to believe. You have to obey the Lord. Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. But Christ has rescued us from this curse pronounced by the law. When He was hung on the cross, He took upon Himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For our wrongdoing. Did Jesus do any wrongdoing? No. But He paid the cost. For our, our wrongdoing. For our sinfulness. I can't turn my back on the man who did that for me. Who paid a debt. And the debt was death. I owed. My, my wages of sin was death. And He paid it for me. Amen. 
For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles, which is us, with the same blessing he promised to Abraham. I told you a while ago, everything that he promised Abraham, everything he said to, the, to Israel, the Jews, remember I told you earlier, he was talking to Israel, but what, is, what he says to Israel is for us also. He's, he's saying it right here. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised Abraham. So whatever he promised Abraham and the Jews, same things for us. Amen? So that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. This is why I keep telling you that everything the Lord told Israel is for us today because of this verse right here. Everything I promised Abraham is for you too. It's for the Gentiles and we're Gentiles. Any, any person who is not a Jew is a Gentile. I don't care if you're Chinese. I don't care if you're Mexican. I don't care if you're Italian. I don't care what you are. You're a Gentile. In God's eyes, we're Gentiles. There's Jews and there's Gentiles. We're Gentiles. And God says right here, everything that I promised Abraham is for the Gentiles. Amen? That is, this verse is, I'm going to start crying in a minute if I don't watch it. <laughs> I get emotional. You know I do. I get, when I'm reading the words of God, I get emotional. When, they, when I'm reading His love for us, I'm sorry, I get emotional. This is one of the reasons we need to be righteous with God. The Lord tells us what to do when we're weak. When we're weak and we have the righteousness of God and we're weak, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, it says, Each time He said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and the results, hardship, prosecution, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So when you think you're weak, when you think you're weak in whatever is coming your way, if you think you're weak, God says right here, no, you're strong. If you're, if you're living in me and I'm living in you, then you're strong. You're not weak. In the flesh you might think you're weak. But God says, no, that's when you're strong. That's when, you, that's when your faith depends on me. To take care of everything that I just, all the scriptures I just read to you. When you believe that, then you are strong. Amen? Amen. When we are out of answers, we're looking for answers, and when we're out of answers, when we're sad, when we're in stress, when we're feeling unfulfilled, our confidence is gone, our strength, we feel we have any, there's no will else to turn, that's what we feel, that's when we turn to God. Lord, this is me. If, there's, if they're all you, what I just said, or one of these is you, we turn to God. We turn to God and say, Lord, you are my fortress. You are my strength. You are my God. But just like when we get sick, when we get sick, Dude, is the first thing we do is go to God to ask to heal us, or the first thing we think of is medicine or doctor? Many of us, many of us, we're guilty of it. As soon as we get sick, we think of medicine or we think of going to the doctor. Instead of falling on our knees, right then and there, and say, Lord, I have this, whatever it is, Can, will you heal me? I pray that it's your will that I would be healed. And then if the Lord doesn't heal you, because He can divinely heal you, we know He can. It's not that He can't. He can, but sometimes His will is not to. Sometimes we go through stuff. And sometimes it's to strengthen us. I'm going to make you stronger by letting you go through this. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He does these things so He can make us stronger. But just like right here, fall on your knees and say, Lord, I'm under stress. I'm un I'm, I'm, my confidence is... Whatever it is, go to the Lord. He'll lift you up. He will not will not abandon you. Amen. Now back to Joshua in chapter 5. The Lord told Joshua to circumcise the second generation of Israelites. The reason was because the Israelite men who were brought out of Egypt during those 40 years, they got, they got totally away from the Lord. After all these miracles he did, I mean he did a lot of miracles. A lot. Even after all those miracles he did, they still got away from him. When Moses went up to, ten, to get the Ten Commandments, what did they do? They made him a god. Well, all those men died during those 40 years. They died. And they didn't circumcise the male babies. 
the reason the first generation of men didn't go into the promised land because they just totally get, got away from the Lord making their own God material stuff Joshua 5 6 says for they had disobeyed the Lord and the Lord vowed he would not let them enter the land he had swore to give us the land flowing with milk and honey the, the promised land so if you're not walking with the Lord are you going to get these promises? No. no. They didn't get them. But because they didn't get them and because they got away from the Lord, God is telling this next generation, He's telling Joshua, get all the male circumcised. Because that's, that's what? That's my blood covenant. That's my blood. They didn't get cut on the hand. They circumcised the males. That was the, that was the sign of blood covenant. And in verse 10, on Joshua 5, verse 10, they talk about having the Passover meal again. They had all the males circumcised to show of the blood covenant. And then they had the Passover again, which was a covenant meal. So they were, they were doing the steps of covenant again. Because the ancestors, the fathers before, failed at walking with the Lord. The second generation was a, was, wasn't any better than the first though. They disobeyed the Lord and looked with their earthly eyes. And what they saw, and they missed out on the promised land. Remember, they got to the promised land, and they sent the spies into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, "It's our land; we can take it." But the other spies, uh, I think there was twelve altogether. Well, the other ten were saying, "No, there's giants in the land; we can't take the land." So Israel decided; they voted. The little thing on voting there. Every, every time I read the Bible and they voted, it goes against God. Every time. That's why I don't vote. I'm not a voter. Biblically. I'm not a voter. But anyway, they voted not to go. So the Lord says, because of your disobedience, because I tell you that's the promised land, I commanded you this to go there. Because of your disobedience, you're going to spend another 40 years in the wilderness. And Israel did. They spent another 40 years in the wilderness. Because of looking with their earthly eyes because they saw giants. They didn't hear the word of God or they heard it but they didn't believe it. Y'all see where I'm going? They didn't believe it. Oh no, we can't take it. There's giants in the land because we're looking with our earthly eyes. We're not looking with our spiritual eyes and hearing you when you said this is our land. So they lost out on it. Same thing with us. If we don't obey, if we don't obey the Lord, we could be losing out on blessings. We do lose out on blessings when we don't obey the Lord. I don't want to lose out on any blessings. I love all the blessings from the Lord. He's given me tons of blessings and I like them. Okay? But to get them, I have to obey. I have to walk with the Lord. And that's an easy thing for me. Because I love the Lord so much. It's easy for me. I don't have to grit my teeth. When you're gritting your teeth, guess what? You're not walking in the Spirit. You're walking in the flesh. Because when you're walking in the spirit, it just comes. You don't have to grit your teeth and say, oh, I can't do that. Or, no. When you're walking in the spirit, it just you just don't happen. Amen? Amen? We need to learn how to walk in the spirit. Now the Lord said in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. And this is also in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. He says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. The first covenant, which is the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments, men failed at it. Men failed at keeping these laws. It wasn't God's fault that we failed them. It was man's fault. We didn't obey the Ten Commandments. We didn't obey the laws of Moses. And these were God's words. It says the laws of Moses, but we're talking about God's words. Romans 8.3, it says, It was because... Of our sinful nature, our flesh was weak. We didn't depend on the Lord. We didn't go to the Lord for help, for strength. We were in the flesh, so we became weak, and we disobeyed these laws. We disobeyed these commands. When when Moses went up to get the to get the ten commandments from the Lord, the Lord the Lord also gave him the blueprint to the tabernacle. Everything that's in the tabernacle represents Jesus in heaven. Everything in the tabernacle. And that's going to be my next teaching, if the Lord's willing. I'm going to teach on the tabernacle. The tabernacle had a fence around it. And they had the, it was a big curtain fence, like a fence. 
And then inside the tabernacle, they had another tent part. And that tent had a veil between it. So it was two sections in that one tent. So for the priest, the high priest was the only one who could go into that Holy of Holies is what it's called. Only the high priest could go in there with our sins to ask the Lord to forgive us. Now, if he was not pure, and now I'm going to get in detail about this, okay? I'm just kind of just touching it right now. But if that priest wasn't pure and holy when he went into that veil, into that Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around his ankle. And the reason they did that, because if he wasn't holy, as soon as he entered, he would die. And they would put bells on him. So as, as long as they heard the bells, then they knew he was alive. But as soon as the bells would stop, and usually it was right as soon as he walked in, if they heard him that he wasn't walking and the bells weren't, they didn't hear the bells, then they knew they had to pull him out because he was dead. Wow. That's just part of it, okay? I'm just yeah, getting you a little, I'm just tickling you with it, okay? <laughs> but it's, 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 it's good. It really is good, but it's very, very serious too. Yeah. Very serious. And this is where Moses would meet with God. And it was also called Tent of Meetings. That's where God would meet. I mean, Moses would meet God there when Moses was, was in it. He was like a mediator between us and God. He was like Jesus. But he wasn't Jesus, so don't even think that. But at that time, he was like a mediator. Yeah. The people would go with their sins and he would bring them before the Lord. And like I said, only, only the high priest could go in there and make sacrifice, sacrifices for God to forgive us. And the priest had to first do his own cleansing. Like I said, if he went in there unclean, he would die. So before he brought our sins in there, he would have to take care of his, of his own. He'd have to purely purify himself before he could take others in there. Like I said, we're, that's going to be a good teaching. But like I said, if he didn't have a pure heart, do you know we have to have a pure heart? We have to have a pure heart if we want to walk with the Lord. We have a pure heart as soon as we ask for forgiveness. So as soon as you sin again, you're no longer pure. Now we have, we're born in a sinful nature, but when you're walking with the Lord, if you're walking with the Lord, you're not sinning. How can you sin if you're walking with the Lord? You can't if you're walking with the Lord. So you're pure at that time. But we will fall. It might be a, a day later. It might be a week later. Well, heck, sometimes it might be a month later. It depends how close you are with the Lord. Some people say you need, you know, Christians sin every day. No, they don't. We don't have to. The closer we walk to the Lord, the longer we can go without sinning. Now, we're not going to be perfect because we will sin. We will fall down. But no, we do not have to have sin in our life every day. And just like the priest, when he went into the, to do the, the matters, you know, take care of the sin offerings and all that, as soon as he came out, he'd have to put on his regular clothes. He had priest clothes on. As soon as he came out, he'd have to put on his regular clothes. Because he was no longer pure and holy to go into the temple. Because as soon as you come out, you know, you're not going to be that way. We're not going to always be pure and holy. Like I said, we're going to sin. But he had to do that. And this is exactly what Jesus did. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. And this is how I'm going to be doing tabernacle. I'm going to show how they did it and how, how it compares to... To what Jesus done. But just like the priest had to take his garment off. In Philippians 2. Verses 6 and 8. Who being in the form of God. Speaking about Jesus. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon the form of a servant. And was made the likeness of men. And being formed in the fashion as a man. He humbled himself. And became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. So he was God, but he took off his God power, took it off. He was no longer in the Holy of Holies. He took off his God power and became a man. 